šodien visi klatis var šeit prieks jūs redzēt. Mēs turpinām mūsu ciklu, lekciju ciklu, kas veltīts Tillera izstādei, kā jūs redzētu. Protams, visi aicināt no 24. augusta apmeklēt mūsu kinozāles un apskatīties arī dokumentālu filmu, bet mēs turpināsim pār runāt par Ivanu Tilleru, un šodien ir speciāls ļoti īpašs viesis, Terijs Smits. Es nezinu, kādi jums vēl būs tādi iespēju dzirdēt šo brīnišķīgu cilvēku, un visticamāk vairs nekādi. Tāpēc lūdzu novērtējot šo vietu un šo īpašu gadījumu šodien Nacionālā mākslas muzejā. Jo patiešām jau jūs meklējat kaut ko par laikmetīgo mākslu. Pirmais, ko jums izmetīs bibliotēka, būs grāmatas, kuras sarakstīs Terijs Smits, kurš jau gan drīz pus gadsimtu pēta laikmetīgo mākslu, pats piedaloties procesos, skatoties uz to visu no iekšpuses un noti aktīvi domājot par to, kas būs arī pēc tā saucamās laikmetīga post-contemporary, kas būs pēc laikmetīgas mākslas, kāda situācija mēs dzīvojam šobrīd. Tāpēc, jā, es nekavēšos un došu to Litviņam vārdu, bet gribu tikai atgādināt, ka lekcija būs angliski, bet pēc lekcijas jums būs iespēja, protams, uzdot jautājumu. Es mēģināšu godprātīgi iztulkot, cik labi, cik es varu. Jūs jautājumi, ja jūs gribēsiet uzdot latviski. It's a great pleasure. I'll say a very small entrance. Uh, introduction to this special event, we have special guest Terry Smith, uh, art critic, art historian, who's writing on contemporary arts from the 70s, mostly uh, nearly half century, and taking part in all processes, starting with the art and language, and, and thinking about how modernism transferred to the contemporary arts through the, uh, on the North American continent and in uh, Australia, and now is thinking about, in a worldwide measure, trying to uh, understand how this, how contemporary artists looking on this world and how that new contemporary world changing all the time, how it shifts the idea of contemporary art and the situation we have in this post-contemporary world already. So the lecture uh, would be today in uh, English and you please ask questions afterwards. If you have any questions now, I'd like you to welcome Terry Smith. Okay, thank you, Edward, uh, very much for that uh, introduction. Not sure about the post-contemporary. <laughs> that needs work, that idea needs work. Um, but um, I am very pleased to be here. My first visit uh, with my wife to Riga. We've already seen how beautiful the country is, and we especially admire how you celebrate your artists. Absolutely crucial thing to do. Allow me to speak in English. I'm afraid Latvian is one of the many languages I don't speak. Um, there are many, many languages I don't speak. Uh, if I could speak Latvian, I, I, I would. I'd like to thank Alita for her invitation to come to Riga and for putting together such an amazing exhibition. It really, uh, I'm sure Imans, I know, is very proud uh, of how his work looks in this gallery. And um, I'd particularly also like to thank Anna, uh, who's been facilitating the visit in a wonderful way. Where's Anna? No, there she is, down the back doing her facilitation. And we just literally, Edward, as well as introducing me, gave my wife and I a wonderful tour of the collection just, just now. Um, so the final acknowledgement is to Michael Brand, the director of the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney, who's come all the way especially to listen to me speak about <laughs> this week about him. Um, no, he's been in the region, he's come to visit your gallery and learn particularly from the way in which you've exposed your collection in that amazing ramp downstairs. Okay, can you hear me clearly, Anna, down the back? Is that all right? Okay, 
So, I will be talking about the general subject of world picturing by contemporary artists, and but Iman Stillers in particular. So, half the lecture will be about the first part, and the second half about Iman's. And um, I've known Iman's for very many years, for decades. In fact, since he was a student, uh, he's a little younger than I am. Uh, he was a student of mine and many other people at the University of Sydney in the early uh, 1970s. And our thinking has been very close, even though we've lived in different parts of the world um, and different parts of Australia for most of our, most of our lives. So, world picturing. Before I focus on world picturing, I'll just sketch the overall perspective on contemporary art that I have that uh, Edward, um, Edward mentioned. Because as you'll see, World picturing is just one of the things contemporary artists do. Um, but they do so within a framework that's in fact historical, and it's absolutely crucial to take historical perspectives on contemporary art. In fact, today and in the exhibition, what we do is trace the journey from late modernism into contemporary art. That's the journey that Imams took, and that many other uh, people, including myself, have taken, trying to understand what's going on uh, as we go forward. And this means that much contemporary art is still modern. It still continues uh, aspects of previous modernisms. And so what I do in all my, all my books is that if anyone asks me a question about contemporary art, I say there are at least three answers to that question, at least three. They're contemporary with each other. They sometimes contradict each other, but it's crucial to understand that there's not a mess, there's not a dominant approach to contemporary art, there are something like three major currents of interest that cluster, like may, currents in a, in a very complex and strange stream. Artists operate mostly within one of them, they operate within sections of one of them, but they interact with each other all the time. Not in an equal way, it's a massively inequitable uh, system as well as um, often a very confusing one. But nonetheless, I suggest to you that we can look across the whole range of art really since the 1970s and 80s, particularly since the 1980s, and we can see emerging or coming through three very large tendencies. One of them is what I call continuing modernisms. And this is focuses on art movements, it's a, it comes out of the history of art, supported massively by the art market. It dominates most public perception of, of uh, what art is today. But in the longer historical trajectory, I think it's receding. It will become a kind of residual current eventually. I'll tell you what replaces it in a little moment. But well-known um, phenomena of postmodernism, the work of Jeff Koons, for example, Retro sensationalism, the work of Damien Hirst, for example. Spectacle art and architecture, um, the work of Gursky or um, uh, Frank Gehry's architecture. And various kinds of re-modernisms that revive modernism in various ways, give it life again, like the work of Richard Serra, just to take some very well-known examples. Um, they constitute, in my mind, a kind of current that reworks and revitalizes and makes new again um, various sorts of modernisms. And that, that's contemporary, it takes contemporary forms, present day forms, it's contemporary with other kind of practices. I'll just show you one particularly egregious example of it. Um, I'm sure a number of you would have been to Venice and had the misfortune to see this exhibition by Damien Perth, um, where the whole of the Palazzo Grassi was um, filled with his basically juvenile fantasy about recovering a lost civilization from under the sea, and guess what? It turned out to produce classical sculptures with barnacles on them, and various other um, objects like that, worth many, many millions of dollars each. Um, so this is an example of contemporary art almost converging with the values of the relatively small number of relatively tasteless people who have most of the money and dominate the contemporary art market. He's been serving their uh, lack of taste for a number of years. 
So that's one of the reasons why that tendency will gradually uh, decline. Um, and it's been supported by the fact that the 0.01% seem to be accumulating enormous amount of wealth and they keep on supporting such art. The second current is much more interesting. Um, it's a current that's become uh, now um, very prominent. It's grown since the 1950s and 60s as previously colonized um, countries, decolonized, found liberation, created new nations, dealt with globalization, um, and have turned to, the, uh, nowadays, through um, working on questions, of ideological questions, working on pressing issues, um, showing their work through Biennales, for example, more than through the markets. These are, this is the work of, of nations and national cultures that have previous, previously been not very powerful in relation to Europe and the United States. They are now, in fact, the work of these artists now um, is virtually everywhere and quantitatively uh, and also in terms of the range of its interests has become uh, very, uh, very, very powerful. And what I've noticed um, looking at this work over the past number of years is that focus on very specific kinds of content has gradually created different forms of art that are themselves new, different compositional formats. And that's something I'll talk to you about in relation to Imans in, in a little while. Because he has generated a very specific compositional format that comes out of this tendency. But just a very, you know, an artist who is at the uh, a leading figure within this tendency at the moment is the, um, the black British artist John Confra, who typically, and um, offended a few, uh, not this year, but the one before, created uh, this amazing six screen installation, sorry, three screen installation, I'm showing you two views of it, where he combined imagery from the BBC Natural History Unit um, relating to uh, the uh, life in the oceans. Documentary film to do with the industrialization of the fish and various um, um, food that could be got out of the oceans and the colonization of various parts of the world, including its great um, um, marine areas by European countries. Um, and celebrating, of course, Haiti places of freedom, one of the first countries to, in fact, um, uh, achieve its own freedom. Um, and a black country at, uh, at that. So um, the history, if you like, of decolonization is there, but when you look at this, this video, and it goes on for, I think, over 35 to 40 minutes, the narrative it's telling us is not a straightforward narrative. It's actually what we get to see are the world's processes, natural processes, historical processes, and human subjectivity changing across a two or three hundred year period in, this, um, in the oceans of the world. It's epic work. It's kind of equivalent to like Diego Rivera for the 2010s. So that current, initially very political, very decolonial, has become very widespread and I think it's shifting the sense of what uh, the world is and how the world connects to itself. The third current um, is one that really doesn't have a name in the same kind of way. It's about a set of concerns, and I hope we'll never end up having uh, a name. Um, but the artists involved here really operate, look for strategies, connections, ways of reimagining all sorts of aspects of the world. And they do so in terms of, again, these three different ways of doing it. World picturing, which we'll talk about a lot today, making art politically, which Iman doesn't do so much, but he does do this thing of worldly. He's less concerned with environmentalism, catastrophe, and developing a sense of the planetary. He is clearly involved in the uh, ethics of time. Um, not so much mediation, by that I mean immediation, I mean immersion in um, uh, communicating media, the net and so on and so forth. So he, his, his work, in, uh, in a sense, comes out of um, late modernism and moves through, absorbs each of these currents. But I think his greatest contribution is in the second current, 
bringing art from many parts of the world together, creating a format to show it, and picking up a certain practice of all picturing that I'll talk about in more detail uh, in a minute. Okay, so three very broad currents, of which I am only going to, in this lecture, focus on the world picturing aspect today. So let me just show you a couple of examples of how that's been done. An installation made for the Paris Climate Change Conference, absolutely crucial, the first time the world's governments got together and signed a document produced by all of them that committed them to do something. Of course, most of them have backed away from it. I hope not from that yet. The Australian government has backed away from its commitments um, at that time, to our shame. But visualising that, showing why it's important to think about the world differently and why it's important to world picture, this is, it's very difficult to do. Um, I can't say, it, I can't point to any individual artist who's really doing it well and leading our thinking about it. It's something that the world in the larger sense has, is, is yet able to imagine. You know, if we could talk about the world as having one consciousness, which we actually can't, unfortunately, but if we could, we would say it cannot yet imagine itself. Right? It cannot yet imagine itself. Um, and we take artists to be the, the people uh, the, the, where we would look for that imagining to find its form. And I think we have to say, that that's a work in progress. And here's an example of one of the finest works in which you're in this space that runs, it's about as wide as from the camera here, runs around to about here. And what it does is it rolls an image of the globe around across the screen, usually in which there are images of continents and oceans together. And in each, it has, a number of iterations, it takes about half an hour to work its way through. But in this particular section, it's showing you the impacts of global warming, not just on, on the Earth itself, the surface of the Earth, but also as temperatures increase around the world. This is obviously towards the end when the temperatures have increased to such an extent that we're gonna, you know, humans have been obliterated long ago. But it also follows things like migrations of peoples around the world rolls around showing you those figures. It shows the remittances from one country to another by uh, people who are migrating. It shows the languages that are disappearing and no longer being spoken. It shows national parks being created, things like that. So it's basically a, a display of a huge amount of uh, data or data about the world um, that's visualized over and over again as if the world is turning and showing you that data. So that's a, a terrifically ambitious effort to, to as a world, world picture. But as I underline, we still use very simple, what I call iconotypes, very simple basic formats whenever we think of the word world. The oceans and the continents, that's the, the iconotype of exploration. The globe itself, the iconotype that appeared when um, the Apollo um, went up, satellite went up and we could see the Earth, that's the other one. The network world is the one that's emerged very recently. It's actually very, there are very few, they keep repeating themselves, they're not enough to do the work, and it's, it's a work of artists um, uh, to, to keep imagining this, and enriching um, our larger consciousness in this regard. So then what that leads to is, I think, a question for artists. I hope there are artists in the audience, I see a number, I'm sure, who might um, pose this question to themselves, um, as I do. I'm not saying every artist has to deal with this question every time they think about making work of art. But in the broader sense of developing a practice over time, and the value of what your practice might be about, is it not? Is this not the question um, that most artists are asking themselves? I won't read it out, you can read it yourself. We're in a state of, and I'll just give you one example of an artist who is tackling this. I'm sorry, it's a question that I talk about in detail in this book, in this series that I recommend to you. It's a whole group of people who are trying to study 
contemporary art in the contemporary condition. And in this particular volume that came out just a couple of years ago, Stonebury Press, I talk about this in much more detail. But here I'll just give you an example of one artist. So if we take Julian Moretto, who's Ethiopian born artist lives in New York, she, in the work such as this, in 2012, pictures the decomposition or the dispersive character of what it is to be in the world now in work such as this. And what she's contrasting work like this with is, I'm um, sorry, I don't know, a work such as this. Um, um, uh, oh, I haven't got the date. Stadia was actually done about 10 years earlier, about 2002. Um, and here you can see, you know, you can actually see suggestions like as if you're in the Olympic Games opening ceremony. And a suggestion that there is a stadium there. But the stadium is uh, coming to pieces, but it's reconstituting itself. So this is a work that leans more towards a kind of constitutive composition, whereas this one leans more towards showing you dispersion and decomposition occurring. But both of them will keep reoccurring. I mean, here we're not just looking at flat painting. We're clearly looking at painting that assumes the mobility of all the elements within the painting. And that's an idea I'll return to in relation to the in a little while. A recent work by her um, is a series of um, a mixture of um, uh, uh, photographs, etchings, and aquatint. Um, and this is an epigraph for Damascus, and you won't be able to see the detail, but in the background here, she's actually sort of profiled elements of the city of Damascus, which, as you know, has been going through a massive exercise of ruining and destroying itself in uh, recent years on all sorts of levels, governmental levels, daily life levels, on every conceivable level, Damascus is in a state of self-destruction. So, it's also, it's not just about Damascus, this is obviously a, uh, an image of the way in which a proxy global war is being fought in that uh, unfortunate country in a way that echoes uh, Cold War uh, differences. So, that's just one artist thinking about these elements of composition and decomposition on a world scale today. There are many uh, artists doing many other sorts, and I could spend an hour or two showing you examples. Um, those of you who are interested might look at that book I just showed, but also my lecture at the European Graduate School that I gave last week will be posted soon, and I look at lots of examples there, and if you want to uh, follow that up on the, on the NGS website. What I'd rather do as a way of moving towards talking about imams is show you work by the people who have been thinking about these things for millennia, for over 40, perhaps 60,000 years, Australian indigenous Aboriginal people have been thinking about the relation between world picturing, trying to understand the world at a huge projective distance, place making, what it is to be in place, to be part of the earth to be in fact the earth manifest in a, in a human specific kind of relation to an ancestor figure in a particular place and to imagine the connections between those two. Because so the elements of world picturing, face making and connectivity, they're the, that's the circle, that's the economy <coughs> that uh, contemporary art keeps recurring to. I mean it's an ancient uh, set of relations. Now we struggle to follow those connections in this constant state of decompositional disconnection that's generated by our uh, economic systems and our current politics. So going back to uh, a kind of practice of world picturing that in itself is enormously valuable but also, as you'll see, inspires imams. I'll just show you one of many works that we're privileged to see 
in Australia to work in the collection of the archaeology of New South Wales. Where Global Unipingu um, recently died, uh, did many of works um, picturing what she calls Garak, or the universe. Garak is a generation of stars, stars being um, produced. And in her way of looking at it, let's see what happens. Okay, right, so this is a transition moment to actually talking about uh, Iman Stillers that you really wanted me to uh, speak about. Um, but it's very important that the ambition to speak about the universe um, and the processes of the universe um, is one that indigenous people uh, have developed to a much greater, more refined capacity than most of us uh, white folk. What you're looking at here is the ways in which stars are created. Stars, in her view, are created by convergences of energy. And the star shape is the result is the result of that converging energy. It's not an object of any kind. So this particular her universe, and for, indeed for the people in this um, in this region, up in um, North East Arnhem Land, the the convergence of, of energies here are creating um, a whole world that we see as the sky, but they do not see as in fact separate um, from the Earth as we do. As well as that. All the dots in the background are what we would call other constellations, like other Milky Ways, if you like. So there's a kind of infinity of creations, points of energy in the universe. So that's one perception of it. Here's a picture of the artist um, uh, before she died, standing next to a painting by her father um, in the Arco in New South Wales. I couldn't get the exact one, but this is another one in the gallery, in which the Eurytion Moiety, Moiety is, is being shown to come into existence with this great crocodile ancestor figure. There's another one here, there's another part of the narrative of people moving from one place to another here, and so on. These are storyboards based on trying to communicate to missionaries um, about the origin stories um, of, um, of these people. Um, okay, so what starts to happen in a very important way in Imams' work that you see downstairs is an effort, first off, uh, to respond to the fact that in Australia we have these two dominant cultures that in effect have been antagonistic to each other. But in recent years, the country has absolutely focused on trying to develop a kind of reconciliation between the white settlers, the immigrants who came from many different parts of the world, including Latvia, and the indigenous peoples who have been in Australia for millennia. The numbers, the percentages are massively unequal. We're talking um, three to four hundred thousand Depends how you count it, only up to half a million indigenous people. We're talking 23 to 24 million settlers and descendants of settlers. There have been a number of works made in the past years where white artists or settler artists and indigenous artists have worked together. This is a spectacular example of that where Michael Ether and a group of friends, which were in fact something like 15 indigenous artists plus some others, used the idea of two worlds. And in fact, underneath here, uh, you can't really make it out, but there's maps of the world, two maps of the world divided down the middle, standard Mercator projections, north and south, and all the various countries. But what they've done is work together to create whole different continents, different sorts of continents that can appear imaginatively if you bring indigenous worlds and non-indigenous worlds into the same kind of space. So Michael Nelson Jackamara, who you'll hear about in a minute, painted this particular section. This is a reference, um, reference to a Melbourne artist, a Melbourne indigenous artist uh, uh, who, who, uh, who died 
just a few years ago, that's his dingo totem, his name is Lynn Onus, O-N-U-S. I could take you through each of these shapes, and they're made by different artists. Uh, Clifford Possum Chapel Jarry, um, another great artist from the Central Desert, did this connecting kind of rainbow serpent type figure, and there are many others. It's a very large work um, that, in effect, is a kind of template for reconciliation. Um, in this case, however, still using the format of the, of the oceans and the continents um, as its uh, basis. Michael Lisa was an important person for Imams to, this, to connect with indigenous uh, people. But in the first instance, um, his relationship to uh, Aboriginal life in Australia was much more contentious. He had the view in the first part of his career um, that he could appropriate imagery from any culture from any culture from anywhere and that this imagery was roughly equal in character and he could bring it onto a surface like the painting you have downstairs such that the fundamental contradictions between these cultures would somehow be elided, somehow be merged. Um, this was in fact not, not the case. What he's doing in a work such as this is bring together a painting by Michael Nelson Jagamara, the five dreamings painting, uh, five different dreamings, the rainbow serpent dreaming here. This is a movement through major parts of the country. Um, there are um, possum dreamings going on down here. This is to do with the movement of water. Um, water dreaming, creation of water. This is wildflower dreaming. There's a bunch of different dreaming. Bringing those together with major works by uh, Yo Buzzelitz, um, who was in the leading, most uh, best known um, German artist at that time. And he's bringing together reproductions of the work of both of these artists into the one work uh, to create this sense of uh, kind of chaos or um, disconnection between cultures on the one hand, but because of his uh, his technique of repeating every panel over and over again, even though disjunctively, they still configure into a kind of field of equivalence. So the tension that he sets up in his art is a tension between having a compositional format that because of the repetitions of the boards creates a ground of equivalence or possible equivalence. Yet, because he's appropriating imagery from all different cultures and always does that in every work, you've got a surface of disjunction, you've got an imagery of disjunction laid over the top. And that tension operates in all of his works. Sometimes they get together to achieve a familiarity and almost an equilibrium, even though in the first time works such as this were shown, they were shocking, they absolutely shocked people, including me. Um, and they also caused local artists serious concern. They, uh, artists such as Gordon Bennett made a work like this one that was picked against this work by Immunds. He appropriated a section of one of Immunds' paintings um, and then he took an image from uh, an illustrated textbook on the history of Australia where indigenous um, uh, people were employed as trackers to help white Australians actually massacre um, uh, Aboriginal people, which they did in their thousands, absolute in fact, no, I can't say how many thousands, I don't know. The exact figure is disputed, but many, many thousands of people uh, were killed as sort of just subhuman um, uh, flora and fauna that had to be gotten rid of. So these um, memories are very much part of um, the way in which um, uh, indigenous artists in Australia think about their own culture and about what art is. In works that you saw before, Imams is not thinking about that um, to a sufficient degree and, he, and received a lot of criticism for that. Subsequently, he did work with Michael Nelson Jackamara. They made a number of works together. They continued to do that. And so in a certain sense, 
he shifted to become a kind of a model of a certain kind of um, reconciliatory consciousness in paintings such as this one. And you've got another one downstairs that is very much in the same spirit. But that took some time. Back in the early 80s, and again downstairs there are some amazing pictures of this period. In the early 80s, he really doubted, I think, whether such cross-cultural constructions uh, was possible. And so in paintings such as this white Aborigines, which has nothing to do with Australian indigenous uh, imagery or Aboriginal people, much more to do with Norman Mailer's book um, uh, on the same kind of theme, um, and using imagery that disconnects with both, there's work such as this, and there's work such as Spirit of Place, where he's evoking the idea of place and going back to a place. But if this is not an image of displacement or the impossibility of finding a place or the absurdity of having such a desire for place, I don't know what it is. I know it's an image from a Latvian children's comic book of some kind and it's associated with and evokes imagery of Aboriginal Australia that in fact comes out of some really badly misunderstood, misunderstood image by Julian Schnabel, who was even worse about this subject. But here you have, I think, an artist um, committed to his um, appropriative technique, but unable to find the, the kind of language um, uh, for at this point, at this point. So one background here that's important is this essay that I wrote in 1974, um, that uh, Edward alluded to indirectly in the Richards and Potter. This particular essay, um, I argued that given the differences of power between New York as an art centre and some other centres, and very distant places like uh, Sydney or Latvia or Riga, the inequities of power between the two created a system where everybody involved, including the people of New York, were in fact provincial. We're all caught in a trap that continually distributed unequal power, made it impossible for people from the colonies or the provinces to become major artists, particularly if they didn't move to New York. And even then, just a few people could make it to the top of the system. Massively inequitable system for everybody concerned. So I wrote about that. Emma, uh, who read the essay and um, has, has said quite often that that was important to him. He was one of the people who developed a quite original response to that circumstance. His circumstance was, let us imitate and be dependent to a, a total extreme. Let's put together the impact of the imagery coming from elsewhere with local imagery, which we know is somehow weak and failed provincial stuff. Let's mix it together and do nothing else but that. In other words, let's be provincial to the extreme. And that's in fact the point of the work that's downstairs, the first work that you see in the show, Conversations with the Bride, where he mixes up two major paintings. Um, there's the elements, some of the elements that you can see down there. He puts together two otherwise totally incompatible, absolutely other sorts of ways of thinking about art. Duchamp's great work, the bright strip there by the bachelors even, the large glass, with a absolutely awesome, straightforward, Hans Heisen painting um, of Australian gum trees. Old fashioned work, conservative art, the most avant-garde art of the early 20th century, most experimental work totally merged in the panels of the um, uh, this work conversation with the bride. So that was a technique that worked for some time. I noticed also upstairs that he he also has been attempted at various times the same kind of mixtures of elements from uh, both in this case I got Latvian pagan imagery about the earth connecting with the heavens, a uh, reproduction of a work by Ed Boucher that uses the word faith and has nothing to do with the religious belief whatsoever, just to have a conjunction of just these two. And similarly, 
um, I learned um, from Edward that this is a work by a major Latvian artist that Imams is mixing up with some uh, commentary from Notre Dame uh, and various other uh, other artists, again in an arbitrary kind of uh, arbitrary kind of mix. So it can work in a way anyway. But I think Imams does two really big things afterwards that I want to highlight in the rest of my uh, rest of my remarks. He understood that appropriation could become a category that showed provincialism at work, and he called that what he called the Book of Power. So the Book of Power became every single panel that he ever did, as if each one, and particularly when they converged into an artwork, one work would be the page of a book that would continue through his whole life, from number one into kind of affinity, a bit of a Roman a polka, um, uh, approach, but not repeating the same subject that, that uh, Polka does, but in effect doing something different, creating a feel. Um, he works towards creating a feel. He hasn't quite done it yet, but a format or a compositional structure on into which anything can be gathered. All the elements of the world um, can be gathered. Um, and then on the face of it, they look like they're being randomly gathered. Uh, imagery from the Basilis, the name Riga. Panels from works by um, Colin McCann, the great New Zealand artist. McCann, um, who, who died in, um, I believe, the 80s, if you like, went on a, a quest to bring together the imagery of his own country, international modernism and his profound religious beliefs into a kind of convergent um, quest uh, in his art. And his art was a record of that quest. It's gradually become clear that for Imams, he's been on a quest as well that brings together a very similar set of elements. Um, and I'll talk about them a little more as I, I go along. But what we're starting to look at here in a work such as Diaspora, which is about leaving your own country, coming back to your own country, being in a state of being always away from your own country, but always aware of your origin. And in his case, origins both here in Latvia, but origins in uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and so on and so forth. This kind of diaspora uh, state of being to me, uh, is being shown as what I call, we could call it in simple terms, a world picture field. He's created a kind of field on which the world can picture itself. It's as if it's a plane, you know, a surface on which elements of the world can appear. We can look across it as if we do a landscape. But in this case, these are not landscapes. They don't have the frame of landscape. It's a much more open kind of surface that shows up um, uh, the imagery that happens to collect upon it. And if you've ever watched Newman's work, it's, it's the way he generates these paintings is quite incredible. He, he works from sketches, he opens books and puts the reproductions next to them, he uh, does some paintings, adds to those, and gradually the whole picture starts to emerge out of a row of stuff he's got on the floor where he's actually putting good images, sketches, paintings and so on and so forth. Uh, it's quite extraordinary. So here, at this particular point in the 90s, and in works such as this Farewell to Reason, um, where again he's combining uh, all sorts of imagery in here, is from Matisse, with vestments um, in the south of France, this actually is from a work by Art Language called Surf Surf. It's about the logic of languages and language services compared to uh, grammar and so on. I could go through the whole thing with being here all day just describing each work, but incredibly disjunctive um, uh, thinking. But what's starting to happen here is, I think, a kind of shift from the book of power, where he's concerned about the provincialism, uh, inequities of provincialism, and is in a way subject to just throwing all these appropriated images in front of us all the time. I think he's, at around this time he started to shift 
and to recognize that he stumbled on a technique where even though you could not represent the world's processes, you couldn't actually picture in a direct way, paint a portrait, uh, or paint in a figurative way, how the world pictures itself to itself. He had developed a format or a compositional structure that was open and yet also constrained and repetitive enough to enable the world um, to picture, enables the, world, the world's imagery to appear uh, on its own surface. I was pleased to see, as you entered the exhibition, um, some works by uh, a quotation, uh, one work that quoted um, Martin Heidegger, because it's very important that um, um, uh, Imans is in fact, I think, referencing some key Heidegger uh, thoughts, which I was going to quote you, but I'll do it. I'll do them from. Um, I'll do them from there. Um, in one of his great essays, the uh, um, the age of the world, the age of the world picture, an essay of 35 to 37 that he wrote actually for the Paris World's Fair, uh, a conference at the World's Fair, um, Heidegger condemned the fact that the modern age, as he said, is defined by uh, seeing the world as picture. For him. To see the world as a picture was to was for something to interfere between you and the actual energies of being, the actual nature of the universe, things that actually grew, people that were actually real. If you put a picture between them, you are not seeing them properly. But then, um, as later in his life, as his thinking evolved after the war, he developed the concept of the fourfold of the universe consisting of the earth, humans, uh, divinities, and various relations between them. Um, and it's no coincidence that in curious ways, um, uh, Imans, I believe, has um, made himself open to these same, same things. I'll just quote you this bit, I found it. So, in his essay of 1951, Heidegger says the following. To preserve the fourfold, to save the earth, okay, to save the earth, to receive the sky, to awake the divinities, and to initiate mortals. This fourfold preserving is the simple essence of dwelling. This is what Imans has been working on throughout his whole career, those four, uh, four things. Seeking the essence of, of dwelling and probably not finding it. Probably not finding it. It's very hard, actually, to find it. But something like that, I think, uh, continues through his work. And so that when you look at paintings such as this, the great metaphysical interior of 1983, this is a painting that actually condemns the possibility of understanding the centre of Australia um, in any way that makes any form, any sense at all. And the Aboriginal imagery is caricature. Again, this is a Stapel figure. There's a Latvian uh, figure uh, together. At that point in the early 80s, I don't think he was, um, he was sort of mocking this ambition of actually understanding how the world pictures itself to itself. Whereas, when we come to an image like this, image of Murano, which is near where he lives, this is when he actually starts to put um, the sense of the divinities of the earth, of awaiting the divinities of being open to the earth and uh, being ready to die as humans. So all these absolutely fundamental qualities of being um, present, they're being presented to us. You know, this is. Deeply, I know he's a very modest kind of man and you would have uh, met him in that regard, but this is deeply serious um, uh, art. Um, looking at the time, I will not go into any detail about another connection that I've made that is very arcane and to do with Australia, but I'll just quickly show you the images because the other the thing that as well as the repetition of the format that, that works across the great, these great 
limited shapes. Something that's rarely talked about in his work is this sense of colour created by light. Right? Colour created by light. The thing that integrates more and more of the paintings and becomes more and more present in the paintings is this kind of almost a, a kind of divine light, a light that comes from somewhere else. Um, and it's just as a peculiar coincidence, and I've just, I'm, I'm in email communication with him about it at the moment, I haven't heard back here yes or no, but there is an Australian author called Gerald Murnane, who I highly recommend to you, those of you who are interested in, if you like, meta-fiction, meta-fiction, fiction that's about fiction, essays that are about what it is to write is there. In this case, the imagining of the plains. So in Australia we have deserts are well known, the mountain ranges are fairly well known, but we also have certain parts of the country, and these are, this is where Imans lives, that have been turned into sheep farms, mainly sheep farms. So um, I'll show you some examples. And it's quite extraordinary. The, uh, there are passages in uh, these books, which I haven't got time to read, but I urge you to have a look at them, where the author, who has himself an Irish Catholic background, um, and has been roughly the same age as him once, spends a lot of time reminiscing about his childhood, and reminiscing about being inside country houses, houses on these plains, and looking out through the coloured panes of the windows in these houses and trying to find states of being beyond the planes in the colours that reflect off the windows. We have a certain colour coming in here. See that pink? Look, have a look at that, that colour that's tending towards a certain pink uh, here. Just that one there. And we should have a blue somewhere. Okay, so down the back of the room I've got this grey blue colour, but I've got this devil. So, for some, in some circumstances, these colours start, that's the artist, that's the kind of house he lives in. This, in fact, is our house, looking out the front door of the house in Sydney. But um, that kind of pink, that, that glass, which looks like it's totally white, in fact, is a pink glass, but with that amount of strain of sunlight, generates this very pale pink, as well as repeating itself. And it's those kind of spaces in houses such as these, which happen to be near, oh, sorry, happen to be, um, anyway, there's, there's concrete connections between certain works and the uh, novels I'm talking about. But they also evoke a whole tradition of Australian landscape painting, and I'll finish with this material, um, that Imams himself is evoking constantly and has become if you like, against the whole grain of being an artist who appropriates, an artist who brings in work from elsewhere, an artist who never invents or uses an image of his own. I'm arguing that he's A, invented a compositional format of his own, that's a very important one for world picturing, but I'm also arguing that he has become in a certain crucial way an Australian artist in our landscape tradition, You'll have to tell me whether he's really has continued to be a, a Latvian artist in your traditions. I don't know enough about them to be able to say that. But I'll quickly show you the precedence to his work. This is the kind of country where Gerald Manane writes about land, very rugged land, cleared for you know, sheep farming, as you see. There's a sheep down here. You're looking outside of this kind of house. This is Halcyon Dream. Uh, and you're also formally, you've got a painting divided in half, you've got a Mobius strip down here, you've got a stop there, and the sky that takes off there. This is also highly conceptual painting, like Emmons's is. The tradition continues. This is again the same area, it's the same mountain painted by a later artist. Um, sheep farms again, but drought conditions. Um, you've got Fred Williams. This is a, not the same. Space. It's a different part of the country, but similar in many of its characteristics. And of course, you would have, um, you would have already anticipated that this is the work he's getting here. So I see work such as this as a kind of summa, you know, uh, a summation 
uh, of um, Emerson's work. So, to summarize what I'm trying to suggest to you, we have a practice that began as entirely appropriative. And the question then becomes, can something that, of which every element is taken from other artists, including, of course, the repeat format idea, um, as such, um, can an appropriative practice generate an original vision? Can it do that? Can you create originality from copying, total, absolute copying? And I think um, the answer is yes, because he's developed a way of doing it that reveals processes that are already there in the world. He's showing us kind of worlding processes. Uh, he's showing us the sort of transformations of the earth that occur within Australia. He's showing us the stages of religious belief. These are the stations of the cross um, by um, Kong Khan. He's showing indigenous um, uh, relation to place, evocations of place, um, origins of the universe type material. We could go on. The other one is Jasper Johns. He's one, two, three, four, five, six, and nine. So he's showing the ways in which the world keeps um, um, its processes uh, occur, he overloads his fields. Every painting is an excess, even though they all end up being fairly calm, I think. As you look downstairs, almost every painting is actually quite a calm work, but they've all been loaded uh, with uh, excessive material. Um, each one of the images may be powerful, but in itself is kind of limited. And each image sees itself as a world picture in Heidegger's sense, a mistaken belief it can understand the world in terms of a picture. Whereas I think what Emmons is striving to do is open himself and his painting, and us, in fact, to the possibility of glimpsing what Heidegger used to call being, being at work the world becoming, the world's incessant becoming. I think that's what he offers us, and um, that's what I've been trying to suggest to you is important about his work, and I thank you for listening. That's based on the photograph, but the photographic the documentary character of it is just not there. 
So I think it raises a very important point. He's not showing the world's processes as they manifest themselves to a machine or even a very skillfully operated um, uh, op uh, machine, you know, a uh, camera operated by a very skilled person. Uh, he's just not doing that at all. Um, nonetheless, world picturing clearly can be done, often is done, uh, through photography. We we were just in um, just in Berlin and saw some wonderful um, exhibition was in the um, was in the Pinakotheka for uh, Moderna Kunst uh, photographs of um, German cities in the 30s, 40s, absolutely stunning. Mainly by photographers who, who just took pictures as they went around. So uh, there's and you know we could now launch into the whole history of way in which. Um, Photography in the 20th century moved, uh, it's hard to generalize, but photography has so many raw picturing energies that are not to do with documenting, you know, that, that, that go beyond documenting, that, that show us world processes that are more than a document. You know. I mean, they are that, but they're so much more than that in most photography. So, I think that's that's great, but it's a whole other thing than what Nancy's doing. Like the yeah. Yeah. If you were asking about the sort of conceptual structure that I'm trying to operate with, it is more um, it is more to do with with understanding how how ideas and concepts and images can appear on a surface. On a See, these are, to me, what's fascinating about this work is that, yes, of course, it's a painting that's standing up and we're looking at it. But almost all of them, are, you've got a slip on there, you can put them down on the ground, you know, and they're almost like, um, they're, they're just sort of areas into which images have emerged. They've kind of appeared. Um, and it's as if they've come up from inside the, the surface. It's the appearance of the images that, that create the surface the surfaces, plus, and that's the puzzle I had in writing this lecture, which is why I, I would have loved to be able to read you some passages from these novels, but because the thing that isn't explained by that is the, the way in which color operates across so many different boards. Each one is painted individually, but he's clearly got a vision of how um, Color produced by certain sorts of light, they're going to integrate this whole thing. He doesn't start the painting. Doesn't start the painting knowing what it's going to look like. He does not do that. Yet somehow or other, this as but as his career goes on, it's not true in the 80s. But as the career goes on, the integration is phenomenal. Yeah. Michael had a comment then. So, anyway. I see a gentleman down on the table. Yes, um, so did I understand correctly that he was criticized for his appropriation of Aboriginal yeah. materials? Yeah. Do you think that he struck a better balance in his most recent work, or is that still something that is controversial within the Australian uh, like, well, art space? He definitely has struck a better balance. Um, partly because in work such as this has got to the point where um, everyone involved, including the indigenous artists, now respect him as an artist and as someone who's reached the level I've been trying to describe. But the earlier ones, like I showed you, um, the earlier ones just didn't do that. I mean, this is a very impressive painting in its way, but it's a disaster from the point of view of from an Australian, both from a white Australian point of view, talks about our great metaphysical interior. This is a fear that white Australians have of the centre of Australia being unsettable. You can't live there. Only a few indigenous people can live there. So Australians have this, I was set for Australians, we all, most of us, 90% of us live on the east coast or the south or bits of the west coast. The rest, um, in a certain conceptual way, although not in reality, um, is the domain of indigenous people who are unknowable. So in this work, 
This is a work about the a white person not being able to understand the centers, uh, what the centers might, and saying, oh, well, that's great, it's fun not to be able to understand it. And I remember debates with him during the 80s where we really disagreed about these points, and the indigenous people did not like them at all uh, for similar reasons. It's disrespectful, you know, but just it's not understanding what's really going on. Um, now, in other works that I mentioned to you earlier, um, so works such as this, he's taken, and he's done a number of works with uh, Michael, Michael Nelson Jaramara, who's a wonderful person, um, very generous spirited, as almost all indigenous artists are. They will object to their work being appropriated, but the way of dealing with the objection is to invite the person to meet, talk about it, make a work together. Let's do something together. Credible gentleness of spirit takes over, and it leads to works um, such as this. Now, so this is basically the five dreamings painting. Really, and Michael Nelson did the whole thing, and the words he must he's retreated. He's just provided a bit of background, and he's put all these amazing words including uh, words from the um, from uh, Michael Russell's language is originally into me. Um, he's calling a metaphysical Australian um, metaphysical thinking about Australia. And if he was a really true Heideggerian, that would be an ironic title because Heidegger hated metaphysics. You know, he wanted a real genuine relation to be. To be totally frank with you, I think this is a weak work. This does not have the energy or the complexity or, in a certain sense, the transcendence of the other works I was showing you right at the back. This is an equilibrium work. So sometimes reconciliation can just be equilibrium, when actually reconciliation is more about differences being in continual conversation, sometimes conflict with each other, that keeps on going. Thank you. Okay. I have a question. Please. Uh, you have uh, written in 1973 the essay about the provincial problem. Yeah. Uh, so, the provincial problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the question is very uh, simple. Now, uh, looking today, how far are we are to solve this provincial problem? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so I often get this question. <laughs> there are three answers to this question. <laughs> um, so, at the moment, we don't have a we to be over the moon. We have. Um, we have. Um, we have political or what we call politics dividing. You know. um, we have, a, um, in a way, a more uh, decomposed world than in the 1970s. However, maybe you can repeat the question because mostly of us did. Sorry, you are beginning of your uh, question. Yeah. Okay. Young times, you know, that the took uh, took start there in some step in the I got that we have even saw an essay. Yeah. It's Skalia. Skalia. Yeah, it's Skalia. But look, man says some at ka parvaret provincialisma. Problem. Well, young times, the tall man says so big. Runai pašo problemo atal na tas teritorijas ka Australija vai Latvija no nelem centrum. All this. Okay, so one of my students answers this question by saying, no, we have not solved it, we've just neoliberalized it. Okay. So many of my younger students have that view. And in a way they're saying that things are even worse than they were in the 1970s, even though the contemporary art world is much bigger. It has hundreds of thousands, if not millions more artists involved in it. Um, it's much more diverse in character. But as I said at the very beginning, it is very much divided. 
See, at the point I wrote the Provincialism Essay, 1974, even the most avant-garde artists, such as those of us in art language, we were in that world, even though we were profoundly critical of that world. We were in that world. And we thought that by critiquing it profoundly, we could change art as such. We could change that world. Since that time, it's become obvious that a lot of art that's made in the world comes, if you like, from outside the art world, into the art world, through the art world. There's no way in which artists, or one artist or even a group, can propose an artistic practice which therefore will have to be taken up in some form or other by all other artists who are serious artists. Whereas in the 70s, that was the case. So what we did in conceptual art, language-based art, every artist in the world who was making any kind of art that wished to be serious, advanced art, consequential art, had to somehow deal with what we were proposing. Just like the generation before, every artist who was at all serious had to think about Jackson Pollock or William Cooney, so we go back through the history. That has changed. There is no artist in the world, or no tendency in the world, that can now claim that all art, or most art, or even significant art, should be of this kind. Right? That's changed. Within the three currents I spoke about, there are artists who are leaders who do extraordinary work within it. And their example, lots of other artists will have. People collect it, people write about it. You know, so they're establishing ways of ways of working, well, ways of being. But there's at least three sets and there are many more complex operations. So in that regard, the idea of Provincialism as the dominance of the art of one place over all the other places, that has changed. We now live in decentered worlds in which dominance occurs in each centre. Even in this city, you will have, um, I predict totally, you'll have structures of cooperation, but also structures of reputation and dominance in power and so on. They will feel stronger in themselves than they would have been in the 1970s, and the artists were feel more able to move globally, much more than then. That's been a great advantage. So in that regard, the provincialism problem has not been solved, but it's been dispersed, I would say. It's been distributed. So that would be my short answer. It's not been solved, it will never be solved, unless we really can somehow change the nature of capitalism, the nature of hierarchies of power, the nature of how we do our government, it will not be solved. Um, but it's been redistributed, I would say. Please. So you could argue that provincialism is an escape from hegemony? Uh, yes, uh, provincial, no. Well, in the 70s, provincialism was hegemonic in itself. That was my argument. It was a world system that, um, that appeared to distribute power to the centres and less power to the others, and artists struggle, 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 struggle. It was hegemonic. Now, it is no longer totally hegemonic. It is just distributed in many ways. So in that sense, yes. Any more questions? No? Okay. That's it. Yes. Uh, well, yes. Yes. Good to know you, Mark. See the form of the city. One word of Nez Misetka. Take the news. Yes, please. Most deep. Most cadetes. Filmas. Divas filmas. Par divem lieliem. Lielam figuram. Pirma ir Megalodons par lielu haizivi. Otra ir par Ivan Tilde. Kas ir liela figura maksla. Tā kā jūsu izvēlēm. Un jauku vakaru!